Amen. Welcome. It's so wonderful to be back with you. You're going to love this. And man, I am just so excited for Awaken Parties. And right now, I know you're gathering around an Awaken Party. I hope the food's good. I hope the fellowship's good with kids running around, having fun. Life, Sunday evenings, Sunday afternoons are meant to be fun. Sunday, fun day. Church in the morning, coming together, and then in the evening, it's still church. It's breaking bread. It's hanging out. So I, I'm just so excited. I think that this is one of the healthiest moves that we've ever done. But don't forget, if you're like, hey, I really miss Sunday nights. It was ministry. It was power. It was Holy Ghost. Great news. Wednesday night, we're putting that on the calendar. For over a decade, people said, how come you don't have a midweek service? How come you don't have a Wednesday night service? Well, it wasn't the right time. Now is the right time. So Sunday, you're going to get a shot in the arm in the morning. Sunday night, breaking bread right around the city with uh, watch parties. I mean, uh, awaken parties everywhere. And then Wednesday night is going to be an incredibly powerful family ministry service at all of our locations. You're just going to absolutely love it. Come with me in your Bibles. We're going to start in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. Today, I want to talk about your times and seasons. So the title of this message is, your times and seasons. But if you're writing it down, you can write down my times and seasons. My times and season. The Bible says this. It says, to everything, there is a season. To everything, there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. I want you to understand that God is the God of seasons. God is the God of times. And God is the God of purpose. There's not one person here and there's not one person watching that God does not have a divine purpose orchestrated for your life. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. God knew you were coming. You may say, well, you don't understand. I, 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 I was an accident. I wasn't meant to be here. No, no. God knew you were coming. Nobody surprised God. He even had nine months to prepare. So he knew you were coming. Not only did he know you were coming, but the Bible says before he fashioned you, before he formed you in the womb, he knew you. He already ordained you and sanctified you, and he had a plan and a purpose for you. You can find that in Jeremiah chapter 1. But God has a plan and God has a purpose for your life. The problem is that too often in Christendom, we come in and we get filled with the Holy Spirit. As we get filled with the Holy Spirit, gifts begin to flow, and that's not the problem. The problem is we think that the time is now. Why isn't God using me now? I want to preach now. I want to prophesy now. I want to lead now. Well, there's two other elements here besides just purpose. There's time and then there's season. And God uses time to season you. How many people know that when you're having people coming over, you can put a chicken in a microwave and they'll probably never come back? Or you can set the oven to 400 degrees, put the chicken in, baste it, put some nice seasoning in the skin and just let that thing sit there for a time. And then in its season, you pull it out and it is Who's getting hungry already? <laughs> and <laughs> crispy skin and everything. God does the same with you. God, God does the same with you and I. In fact, if you were to say, How, what's, the, what's the greatest way that I can look at my life? I would say it's like a seed. Uh, my daughter, I've promised her in our backyard, we're going to plant some orange trees and some avocado trees. She wants a few others now as well, but we're going to at least start there. And she loves putting seeds in the soil. In the last place, we had a lemon tree, and she loved when those first lemons popped up on the, on the, the branches, and she began to pick them and, and uh, made me have them because she said they were too sour for her. But she just loved the whole process. Now, you don't put a seed in the ground today and then tomorrow go, where the heck's my tree? In fact, if you talk to any horticulturist, they will tell you that, that you need to plant a seed in a certain season. You don't plant them in the summer. You don't plant them in the winter. You plant seeds in the spring. The ground is prepared. The ground is prepared in the winter, but the planting takes place at the beginning of spring. And by the end of spring, you have little sproutlets. But it can take a time. It can take sometimes years until that tree begins to produce fruit. The Bible says, lay hands on no man suddenly. 
this is this is not a, a great message to hear if you just got saved and you're on fire to God and you were fire for God and you are ready to go and you are ready to preach. Because what God is going to do, he, He's going to throw you into a time and a season to season you and to test you to produce great fruit. Do you know what's really interesting is that uh, Leanne and I, if we look at ourselves as seeds, God took 15 years of shaping us in two different nations, New Zealand and Australia, shaping the DNA of our seed, the DNA before he planted this seed in San Diego. The ministry that we see flourishing here is, is the result of 15 years of that's in ministry. And then there was a number of years before that, before we even went into ministry, where God was working on the DNA of the seed, pulling out all the impurities, pulling out all the compromises, pulling out all the, the, the junk, getting the seed right before he always had a plan that we would come to San Diego, but he took us through a time and a season. You are a seed. You began as a seed. And if you can see yourself as a seed, it's going to help you. So Paul, the apostle Paul gets radically saved. We know he saw, but he has an encounter with God on the road to Emmaus. He gets knocked off his high horse, literally, has an encounter with God. And he no longer goes by the name of Saul, but goes by the name of Paul. Saul was a persecutor. Paul, the architect of the New Testament church. But the Bible tells us that there was a season where Paul didn't immediately preach, but went out into the wilderness. Some say for at least seven years, some say up to 13 years, he was in a wilderness. He was away, just allowing God to season him, allowing time to take its toll, allowing God to do a work on him. The reason we have an internship program is, is it, it is not just that we want a, a hotbed and a seedbed for future hires. What it is, it's a development program. It is a, it is a fast track. Uh, if you plant seeds in the soil, in the atmosphere, those seeds are vulnerable to the elements. They're vulnerable to rise and falling temperatures, to frost, to blight to mildew, to storms, to but but you'll notice that a lot of places they they grow fruit and they grow plants in a in a uh, glass house or they call it a greenhouse and it has it has a thermostat and it, it is protected from the elements and it's and so everything is done hydroponically and everything is done so that it is rapid it is accelerated in the growth that's what our internship program is. Our internship is an environment, a supernatural environment to fast track what God wants to do in you. But even with the fast tracking, we refuse to microwave a roast chicken. We refuse to microwave the call of God. If you would not eat a chicken coming out of a microwave, we don't want to serve our city. We don't want to serve San Diego, a microwave version of the call of God, of the destiny of God, and of the purpose of God on your life. And so you need to understand that, that God is seasoning you, and He uses time to do that. Did you all catch that? So, so sometimes we can be in a rush. Well, when's my time? When's my season? How do I, how do I accelerate? How do I, I'm glad you asked that. I preached a message a, a couple of years ago called the 1140 factor, the 1140 factor. And basically what it was on was it, it was an 11 day journey from Goshen to, to the Jordan, to, to cross the Jordan to go into the promised land. It was an 11 day journey, yet 40 years later, they're still wandering in the wilderness. It had nothing to do with the fact that they had a broken compass. It had nothing to do with the fact that God hadn't thought it through. It had nothing to do with the terrain or the geography. It had everything to do with their mindset, their mentality, and the stubbornness of their hearts. God said, I've delivered my son out of Egypt. But they did not see themselves as children of God. They saw themselves as slaves of Pharaoh. You may say, well, Pastor, that's just semantics. No, it's not. You can't enter into your destiny if you see yourself as a slave to your past. If you cannot enter into what God has for you, if you see yourself as the oppressed, if you see yourself as a victim of somebody else's, they weren't victims anymore of Pharaoh's oppression. They were recipients 
of God's mighty deliverance. They were beneficiaries of God's blessing, God's mighty hand, God's fulfilling of His promise. And yet it was much easier for them to identify with the pain, with the broken, with the abuse, with the oppression, with their history than it was with their destiny. For you to inherit your destiny, you have to let go of much of your history. There were so many times in my life where God says you need to forgive. Let, let, let me just tell you this. I'm going through a thing at the moment uh, just with, my, with my, my father who's 78 and just God has filled my heart to bless him. And I was lying in bed the other night and as I'm laying in bed, it was the most beautiful thing because my heart was overflowing with blessing. And then I realized Manashe Ephraim. Manashe Ephraim. Joseph ends up in Egypt and gets married and he has two children. The first child he calls Manashe or Manasseh, which means the Lord has caused me to forget. The Lord has caused me to forget. And then the next one, Ephraim, is fruitful in a foreign land. And I realized, I realized that all the pain, like my goal when I got saved when I was 18 was I'm going to punch my dad's head in. I'm going to beat my dad up for all the years of abuse. I'm going to, you know, mum wasn't strong enough to, to stand up to him. So when I turn 18, I'll be the one and I'll defend my mother's honor and I will be, and I had hatred. And even when I got saved and God said, you, you can't do that, that's off the table. I said, you know what, God, all right then, I'll just hate him for the rest of my life and I'll just ignore him. As far as I'm concerned, I have no father. And, but my heart was, and God's like, no, no, son, you can't minister because you're a seed and every seed reproduces whatever is in its DNA. You're gonna re reproduce people who don't forgive. You're gonna reproduce people who are bitter, who are nasty, who are angry, who resolve conflict the wrong way, the incorrect way. He says, I need you to let me do a work on you. I need you to let me do a work on your seed. But I'm lying in bed the other night night and there's no animosity there's no anger there's no hostility and out of my mouth comes Manashe the Lord has called I can't even I have to go into the sea of forgetfulness illegally like there's you know forbidden and I've got to kind of sneak in over the fence to get in there to try and find some of the offenses from the past what a beautiful way to live was there abuse absolutely was there nasty absolutely was there neglect absolutely absolutely but it's, 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 it's almost not even in my heart anymore. In fact, I would say it's not in my heart anymore. The Lord has caused me to forget. So let me just give you some thoughts today. How do I then fast track? How do I fast track? How do I fast track? I don't want to be the 40 year. I want to be the 11 day journey. Anybody like that? I want to step into my destiny. I want to step into my, my call. Well, God has one prerequisite. God has one supernatural fast track and it's called faithfulness. It's called faithfulness. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful. God, God always tests us with uh, responsibility before he trusts us with authority. Did you know that? I don't understand why I've got to serve on a team. I'm anointed to be a prophet. I can prophesy. Well, that's wonderful that you can prophesy, but it really doesn't impress me because Paul said you can all prophesy. So, well done. <laughs> but what is amazing is you serving. You serving. Serving in kids' church, serving on a parking team, serving in the cafe, serving in the foyer, serving on ushers, serving on cleaning duties, serving on janitor, serving in an area. You know, isn't it interesting? Jesus walked on water, and yet he washes the disciples' feet. You think he couldn't just go, yin, and all the disciples' feet start sparkling. They got little, little, little pedicures. The little toes like, he put varnish on my toe. I mean, you think he couldn't have done that? Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And I'm kind of thinking, man, if Jesus can serve, then who do I think that I can bypass that system? I had somebody many years ago say, uh, hey, you know, I'm ready for leadership, but hey, uh, I served in my previous church. I'm kind of graduated beyond serving now. I'm like, yeah, well, guess what? If you think that leading is not serving, then you're a terrible leader. And I don't want to put you anywhere near authority. Dear Jesus, you'd be a brutal dictator. We never stop serving. 
we never stop serving. We are always serving. Moses was serving Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, when he took his father-in-law's flock. They weren't Moses' sheep. They were his father-in-law's sheep. He took them to the back of the desert, Mount Horeb, when a bush catches on fire. Moses, Moses, take the sandals off your feet. Because God just sounds better as a Latino. Moses, Moses, take the sandals off your feet. For the place where you are standing is, a, is holy ground. I mean, that's just how God sounds. Some of you are looking at me in disbelief. Let me tell you how God doesn't sound. I definitely know that God's not Australian. Moses, Moses, take the sandals off your feet, mate. Take your thongs off. Place your standards on holy ground, you pelican. You silly galah. He's definitely not. So anyway, so Mo- Moses was faithful. He was faithful when God called him. Saul was looking for his father's donkeys. His father had lost his donkeys. And Saul takes his servant and says, let's go and look for the donkeys my daddy lost. And in the midst of looking for donkeys, Samuel anoints him to be king over Israel. He finds his destiny. He finds his calling in the midst of being faithful. David was looking after his father's sheep when there was a war. Goliath was in the valley. And uh, Jesse calls David and says, take these 10 cheeses, these skins of wine, these loaves of bread, go down and give them to the captain of the army and see how it's faring with the, with the war and bring back word to me. And David is serving his father. David is being faithful to his father when he gets down there and the call of God comes upon him. You will find that the greatest thing that you and I can do is serve. I, you know, I just think that at Awaken Church, like they try and get you into volunteering because it's all about slave labor. It's about, you know, no, no, can I just tell you the greatest gift, the greatest gift we can afford anybody is a place where you can serve, a place where you can volunteer, a place where you can be faithful because God says, well done, good and, he doesn't say well done, good and gifted. He doesn't say well done, good and anointed. He doesn't say well done, good and talented. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will elevate you now and make you ruler. Ruler means authority. I tested you with responsibility. I will trust you with authority. I tested you with responsibility. I trusted you with authority. There's, you know, the parable of the talents. Five talents, two talents, one talent. And what's interesting is that faithfulness cannot be tested in the presence of authority. Authority must leave the room. Authority must step out of the vicinity because when the boss is there, <laughs> I'm just doing some spreadsheets right now. You were playing solitaire. Yeah, boss. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it looks like, uh, looks like sales are a little down last month, boss. And then as soon as boss goes out, you're back onto solitaire or TikTok. <laughs> Faithfulness can't be tested in the presence of authority. Faithfulness is only tested when nobody's watching, when nobody's seeing. The Bible says he gave five talents, two talents, one talent, and then went away to a far country on a long journey. In other words, there was no supervision. If you need somebody to continually supervise, if you need someone to continually bring you into line, if you need someone to continue, if poor old uh, Pastor Dr. Matt's got to continually bring you in, say, I gave you this, where is it? Why did you drop that? If, if, if leaders have to keep following up, guess what? You're, you're, on, you're leaving the 11 and you're looking at the forty. You've gone from the 11 to, to the 40. But if you can say, hey, whatever you give me, Master, you entrusted me five talents. Look, I went and traded with those. And here I produce, well done, good. And 
Nobody was supervising. Nobody was checking up on you. Nobody was following up. You understand you are now ready for authority. If people have to keep correcting, if people have to keep governing, if people have to keep, you know, watching over you, if people have to keep, well, you're not ready yet for leadership. Yeah, but I'm anointed. And I had a prophecy. I had a prophecy way back from, from Catherine Kuhlman and Smith Wigglesworth. And they all surrounded me and they prophesied over me. And Charles Finney was there. And then poof, poof, and Moses and Elijah appeared to me and they began to speak to me. And, and uh, that's all awesome. But you know what? Right now you ain't ready because you can't be faithful at your post. Let me just tell you about Joseph. Joseph is one of my favorite blueprints in the Bible because God took Joseph through unbelievable tests of faithfulness. The first test of faithfulness is can you be faithful in adversity? Can you be faithful when life or people or friends are against you? When I got saved, all of my friends turned against me. The enemy knew that I had suffered severe rejection from and I was Mr. Popular at school, Mr. Popular. And so the devil thought if I turn all his friends against me, he'll surely ditch Jesus. He'll ditch Jesus. The first area of faithfulness was would I ditch Jesus to try and win my friends? But I knew that I was so broken and empty when I had all my friends. But what I received in Jesus was so great. The peace in my heart, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go with Jesus, even though it may appear to be a lonely road. The first test is the test of being faithful in adversity. There are going to be times in church where you are misunderstood. There are going to be times in church where your family members or friends may turn their back on you. They may persecute you. They may not understand. I know so many people who have lost relationships with family members because they're pursuing the call of God, because they're standing up for Jesus. It is a test. It is a test. And can I encourage you? Be faithful in adversity. The next one was faithful in betrayal. Faithful in betrayal. There are going to be times where you feel betrayed, betrayed by loved ones, betrayed by a Judas, betrayed. Joseph's brothers betrayed him. They threw him into a pit, talked about killing him and then sold him into slavery. But he stayed faithful. He didn't get a grudge. He didn't get all bitter. You don't understand. I'm never trusting authority. I'm never trusting anybody ever again because he, he didn't live out of his wound. He lived out of the dream. He didn't live out of the wound. He lived out of the calling, out of the purpose before him. And when he looked at the wound, he, he knew that the wound was, was, was too small to eclipse what God had called him to. There was a test of being faithful in rejection. He was rejected, faithful in oppression. He, he, was, he was oppressed as a slave, treated as chattel. Part of his wife, run my slave, run my bath, bath for me, slave boy. Now disrobe. And he's like, uh-uh. She's like, you, you, we own you. You do what we, faithful in, a, faithful in injustice. Injustice. He goes to prison for attempted rape. He did nothing wrong. How many people would be there? You know what? Yeah, where was God? Where was God? Are you talking about God? Yeah, well, where was he? I did nothing wrong. She tried to seduce me. She was, you know, my, my brothers. And he had, he, out of his mouth could have overflowed all the bit. And yet he just kept being faithful to God. He kept, you know why he was faithful to God? Because he knew that God was the judge of the earth. He knew that God is the author of righteousness and justice. God is not weak. God is not slow. God is patient. God is loving. God is kind, but God is God. And he saw that God is a God of justice. He was faithful in false accusation. He was even faithful in being forgotten and overlooked. Remember when the butler and the baker came to him and, uh, and he interprets their dreams. And then he says, hey, remember me when you go back to Pharaoh? Yeah, yeah, man, you got it. As soon as they get there. And then the guy forgets. And then Pharaoh's tormented with the dream. He's like, oh my gosh. I've sinned three years ago when I was in the prison. Three years later, Joseph's still rotting in the prison after blessing other people. There are going to be times in your life where you're like, man, I was the one that came up with that. I was the one serving, and they got promotion. They got elevated. That was me. I was the one that initiated all of that, and now I feel forgotten. Now I feel overlooked. You know what? I'm just going to quit. You know what? I'm just going to go. I'm going to go and work at Home Depot. That's it. I'm out of here. I'm just going to go and get a job at Walmart. You know what? I'm going to go. Don't, don't let go. The call of God is way too powerful, way too important. God will test you. He will test you in a 
season, can you be faithful where it feels like you're forgotten? Can you be faithful where it feels like you're overlooked? Because can I tell you, there is no unemployment in the kingdom. The number one element that God looks for is faithfulness. And if you can be faithful, but he's testing that faithfulness. In fact, in, um, in Luke 16, this is meant to be my second opening scripture, but in the 15 seconds we got left, let me read it to you. Jesus says in, Ma, uh, in Luke 16, verse 9, he says, And I say to you, make, make, make friends for yourselves of unrighteous mammon, so that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Whoever is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. Whoever is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So if somebody can't do a little thing well, don't give them a big thing. In fact, how you do the little thing determines how you do the big thing. Dr. Matt says how you do anything is how you do everything. How you, how you treat the rental car. If you have therefore not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches of the kingdom? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another man, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or else he'll be faithful to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So the three areas in closing, and I've got the red letters up there. The three areas is, can you be faithful in what is least? Faithful in what is least. When I felt God calling me to go to Bible college, the dream was to preach. The dream was to lead. That was the dream. And then I got put in charge of setting up chairs. I'm like, I'm not sure if you heard me. The dream that God spoke to me was preaching and leading. And they're like, yeah, okay. So we need the chairs in rows. We need them in groups of like rows of 10 with an aisle. I'm like, oh, sorry, I didn't mind. No, the dream I had was preaching and leading. Yeah, and what we need is we probably need 10 rows in every section. And I'm like, this is the, this is the, but God was saying, I can't give you that if you can't be faithful with that. Because there are four Ps that God deals with, pride, power, profile, and position. People with pride, people who seek after power, people who are all about their profile or their position can't serve in what is least. They can't serve in what is least. You you asked me to serve where? Kids church? Are you serious? No, no, I'm called to real people. I had somebody years ago, I had somebody years ago, true story, somebody years ago came up to me and said, hey, I got a word for you. You're not gonna preach to youth anymore. God's gonna call you to preach to real people. Because apparently youth aren't real people. But it's amazing some people's mentality. No, no, this is beneath me. This is beneath me. If washing the disciples' feet was beneath Jesus, do you really think just a couple of days later he'd be able to to take nails through his wrist, a crown of thorns on his head, and a vicious beating on his back to save mankind? He knew I must do this because if I can't wash the filth from between your toes in an upper room, there's no way I'm going to be able to wash the filth of the sin and degradation of humanity away from them on a cross, on a crucifix. I have to, nothing can be beneath me. Nothing is too great. I've got to give myself to be faithful to what is least. The second one is unrighteous mammon. Can you be faithful with money? Do you have money or does money have you? I don't like Awaken Church because they always speak on tithing. I'm leaving that church. And list, list, honestly, there are cheaper churches to go to. Knock yourself out. You can go there. They're not going to ask. I mean, they're not buying buildings. They're not taking ground. They're not advancing. But hey, at least you can keep your tithe. At least you can hang on to it, Judas. I mean, no, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. That was naughty. That was very naughty. The greatest, the greatest Listen, I love, I love the fact that I'm in a church where, where I get to give. Because the Bible says where your treasure is, there your, come on somebody, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Leanne and I would not have, we would not have made it in ministry if we didn't learn to give. I was so mad with God. I'm like, God, 
you send us to New Zealand and there's no freaking salary. And then the church grows because the youth ministry explodes. And now the church has got money and they put us on a pitiful salary, insufficient to meet the needs. Come on, God, be fair. Why can't I be paid what I'm worth? And God's like, because I need to show you that from the hand of man, you will never get it. So you've got to look to the hand of God. I, I, I regretted it at, the, at the, the time, but I wouldn't change it right now because it forced me to learn to give. It forced me to learn to sow. It forced me to learn to bring the first of anything to bring the tithe to the Lord. And when we would do the math after the tithe, there was, there was no way we could make it. And yet supernaturally, week by week, as we were faithful to God, He was faithful to us. As we were faithful to His house, He was faithful to our house. I had no idea that God was saying to me, I got to test you with money. I got to test because I can't give you the true riches of the kingdom if you can't be faithful with mammon. If you can't be fa- you think, well, it's just about the tithe. It's just about the church paying its bills. And so, no, 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 no. Jesus says, who will give you or entrust you with the true riches of the kingdom if you can't be faithful with unrighteous mammon. But if you can be faithful with money, guess what? God's going to increase the anointing, increase the giftings on your life. The last one, I'm in big trouble. I'm so sorry, Megan. Uh, But the last one, number three, why are you doing this to me? And uh, the last one, what belongs to another man? Can you be faithful in what is least, faithful in unrighteous mammon, and faithful with what belongs to another man? Elisha, who did twice the miracles of Elijah, his reputation was, this is he who pours water on the hands of Elijah. Like That's not a really great resume. Uh, we need another prophet in Israel, and uh, you've, sent your, um, you've sent your resume in, and it says here, you poured water on the hands of Elijah. Is that, is that correct? Oh, yes, sir. That's, that's what I did. I, I poured water on him, and Sometimes I cooked him breakfast in the morning and, you know, when he would go out, I would make the beds and tidy the, yeah, yeah. Uh, Not sure what part of we need a prophet. Like someone who can prophesy. Have you got any tapes of you prophesying? Is there any like predictions you've come up with that have come to pass? Something notable that we can, no, no, I just poured water in the hands of Elijah and, you know, made breakfast and cleaned up after him and. Mop the floors. Oh, okay, yeah, we'll get back. No, but in the kingdom, in the kingdom, God says, transfer the anointing from him to him because he is faithful with what belongs to another man. Can you be faithful for someone else's, to someone else's benefit? God will always take you through a season where you're an armor bearer. In fact, Leanne and I believe that we've never stopped being armor bearers. We, we, we are armor bearers to the kingdom of God, to the church of God. It's a good thing for you to not become so myopic that your world is all about you. Serving Pastor Phil and Chris, building C3, building that movement, pouring into other leaders, prepared us and put in us a, 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 an understanding that it's always about other people. It's always about other people. God will always take you through a season where can you be an armor bearer for somebody else? Jesus says, if you can't be faithful with what belongs to another man, well, that's not my vision, pastor. That's not my dream, pastor. I know that. I know that. God knows that. And he wants to give you your dream, but he's testing. Can you be faithful to help someone else's dream come to pass? Because the dream that God's got for your life is too big for you to make happen. And God knows that you're going to need some people who devote themselves to you to making your dream come to pass. And if you have failed to sow it over here, then you can't reap it when you're in your season over there. So God gets you to be faithful with what belongs to another man so you can reap it over here. And I'm way over time and I'm in big trouble. And uh, But lift your hands to heaven. Father, I just thank you right now. The 1140. No, no, no. We're going to be the 11. We're going to be the acceleration. Father, we thank you for faithful people, faithful people. It is a gift to serve Jesus Christ. They're not extracting volunteer hours from me. Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And because I lay it down, I have authority to pick it up again. If you feel like church is taking from you, take a sabbatical. Take a seat for a moment. But the greatest thing you can do is find a place where you can serve. 
where you can be faithful. God will test you in your faithfulness so he can promote you and give you fruitfulness. That's what God does. And he wants to elevate you with authority. You may be saying, when's my time? When's my season? You're in your time. You're in your season right now of preparation, of being faithful for the time of elevation, the time of promotion, the time of positioning, and the time of fruitfulness will come dependent on how well you serve. Father, bless these beautiful people. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. We love you. God bless you.